Hi, so this is the unscheduled rerun of the of our webinar when CRO goes wrong. I'm Ben Hunt and I'm the author of the book Convert which came out in 2011. And I'm Shane Malach and I'm the CEO of Thrive Themes and we build conversion focused tools for WordPress. So uh, we uh, we tried to run this webinar earlier on today as part of CRO day and unfortunately we had technical problems which meant that Shane couldn't get on the on the webinar as the other presenter so we're doing it all again especially just for you yeah better this time all right <laughs> okay so th this is going to be a slightly different kind of uh, conversion rate optimization talk really because i mean what what you normally get from these kind of talks and presentations is you get something positive and upbeat packed with best practice and promising takeaways that you can just start to apply in all your own marketing uh, immediately. We're not going to do any of that. We're actually going to maybe mess with your head a little bit and take a look at the, the shadow side, the dark side of CRO. Because we're going to be looking at where the ways in which it doesn't work. Uh, why sometimes you shouldn't use it, when you shouldn't use it, or shouldn't rely on it. Because the truth is that in our experience, and you know, Shane and I have both been split testing for years, sometimes CRO is not your friend. It can be mischievous. It can lead you down the wrong path. So what we want to do is we want to want to help you to um, get a, a dose of, of wisdom so that you're going to be more empowered going forward to use these tools the right way. How does that sound? Yeah, absolutely. So, and if we maybe go to the next slide, um, I think another interesting thing is that, you know, Ben sees this whole thing from his work with clients that he's done for a long time. I see it from like the software side of things because we create conversion software and testing software. And what I can see or what we both agree on is that a little knowledge is a, is a dangerous thing, especially when it comes to conversion optimization and testing, right? If you, if you know just a little bit about it and you just dabble in it a little bit, uh, there are many pitfalls where you can, you can end up following the data in the completely wrong direction. And the idea is that after this presentation, you will know these pitfalls and these dangers and you, you will know what to look for and what to avoid so that conversion optimization and testing actually works in your favor. Mm. And I also think that it, it, this is an interesting quote because very often what conversion testing tools or split testing tools gives you is a little knowledge as well. It yeah. gives you a little bit of data that can suggest that something is going in the right direction. And what, what we're going to try and um, demonstrate today is that uh, sometimes it's just not true. And, and, you know, on the previous side, I, I, I was saying uh, they're, they're lying to you. Um, very often what people will say to you, but particularly people who are selling courses or selling, selling seminars, right, will say to you um, that there's a magic bullet, there's a holy grail, there's something that you absolutely must be using. And if you're not using it, you're crazy. And CRO can be one of those things. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely also with software, you know, use this software to boost your conversions, double your conversions or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It sounds nice, but no, basically, no. There, and so, there, there's so, yeah, there's so many ways in which people can, can use data statistics out of context. We've all heard the quote, there's lies, damned lies, and statistics as being yeah. the worst, you know, and, and this is one of those areas. Great. All right. So the first, that's the first thing that we want to look at is a technical issue of can you even trust the numbers that you're seeing in your testing tool? So on the next slide, this is an example of a test that I ran not too long ago. And what we're doing here is we're testing, uh, the conversion goal is a purchase, right? A product purchase. And we're testing to see, uh, we're testing the revenue generated in each uh, test variation. And we're testing or we're measuring uh, the revenue per visitor for each test version. So here we have, as a result, an aggregate result, we have on the control, we're making $10.46 per conversion, uh, no, per visitor. 
Uh, variation one, $8.45 per visitor. Variation two, two dollars and three cents per visitor so and this was run for 16 days about 120 something conversions so that's not that much data yet but if you look at this graph if you look at this graph right now what do you think we can learn from this and if you're thinking that well we can probably learn that this variation too is underperforming quite badly unfortunately that's wrong uh, and the problem is, it's essentially a trick question that I'm asking here because you can't actually see the only lesson we took from this test from this data. The only lesson we took from this test is that we have to stop this test and scrap the data because it is simply wrong. Mm. And the way we found out about this is that we looked at, um, at these same numbers, we looked at these same numbers in a different tool in Google Analytics and we matched it up to the actual revenue that was being generated for the product sold on this page and the numbers just don't match up. So in reality, we don't know whether variation two is actually making a lot more money than the others or not. We simply don't know. And one of the issues is that you know, the tool won't tell you that it's making this mistake and the tool will always give you very authoritative looking results. You know, it's very, very authoritative looking graphs and, and clear numbers and stuff. And it's one of the things that you can be blind to very easily is that stuff just doesn't work sometimes. Now, you can try this at home very easily. If you're wondering, you know, why is this happening? Why is this wrong? You can try this at home very easily. If we look at the next slide, you're probably using Google Analytics on your site already. Most people do. Uh, just go ahead and install a second tool that does the same thing. You can you know, install something like Peewick or, um, or Clicky or Heap Analytics or whatever. There are dozens of analytics tools, right? And all of them will do the same basic thing in that they will count the number of visitors that come to your website. Now, you can just install two tools in parallel and then compare the numbers and you will see that the numbers do not match up. And that is simply one of the, it's just in the nature of measuring stuff is that there's always going to be a measurement error. You will never have the exact correct number of exactly this many people visited my page. Which also means that every number that is, a, that, that is a subset of the number of visitors to your page, such as how many of them made a purchase, has, will, you know, will, it will accumulate um, errors every step along the way where you do measuring. Okay? Mm. And that's just one of the realities of measuring and data that you have to be aware of and that you have to... Um, keep your eye on. Yeah, but this this is a massive difference in yes. in the success rate. Do, do you have any idea what caused it, or how people can help avoid that kind of thing? Yes. So, um, so what happened? What the the case here was simply that somewhere in the technical setup of our shopping cart, talking to the testing tool and reporting correctly, um, you know, which variation was generating revenue. So, somewhere in that chain, there was a technical issue in the setup. Okay, and we haven't solved that yet. We haven't found out what exactly is going wrong yet. But my point uh, here is simply that um, you have to, like, you have to keep a lookout for that. And I mean, the alternative that we're currently using is that we're tracking the same data in Google Analytics, and in Google Analytics, it matches up with our actual shopping cart. And so we're running the test in the testing tool, and we're evaluating the results in Google Analytics until we find out what, what the heck is going wrong and why we can't evaluate it in, in Google Analytics. Yeah. And so the, the takeaway here is on the next slide, what, what you should do in all your testing is, um, is basically have a contingency for this. What you can do is you can use multiple goal measurements for the same goal. As a very simple example, if you're trying to increase the number of people who sign up to a mailing list or submit a form or something, you can test the form submit as a conversion goal and also test the visit to the subsequent page as a success page as a conversion goal. And theoretically, both of, the, both of those are identical, but in your measurements, you will see some differences. You can also measure the same stuff in more than one tool. So that's what we're doing. We're measuring it in our testing tool and in Google Analytics. We're you know, tracking the same stuff, the visits. We're tracking who sees which test version. We're tracking the revenue and so on. And test, you know, compare the numbers you're getting in your tool to your most reliable data source 
Um, that's like the bottom line data source. Like the, how much money do you actually have in your bank account? That's like the bottom line data source, right? And your, all the data from your tools should end up matching up more or less with that. Mm. And the, the reason for this kind of contingency is, is not, you, you know, if you see a 5 to 10% difference in these, uh, in multiple tracking tools or between multiple goals, that's just normal. That's a normal testing error. And you just have to collect enough data to make up for that. But if you see big differences like we saw here, where it seems like one of the variations is underperforming, but actually in, in another tool, it, the, the difference isn't that big, then you know there is something more severely wrong in your whole testing setup. And that's something you need to fix. So, th so the point of, uh, of this contingency plan is to be able to detect when something is seriously wrong versus when it's just a small standard measuring error. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can actually concur um, that the, I've, I've got an experience that backs this up with working with, with one client as fairly big business, yeah, seven figure monthly turnover. Mm -hmm. And they were simply reporting that some of the tests that we ran, that the, their own uh, server logs didn't back them up. So eventually what we did was we, we actually ditched the, the uh, CRO platform that we were using and they, they coded their own measuring tools because that's the only thing they would really trust. Right, yeah. you know? So it, it's almost like we can say that almost any me measure, measurement that you can use is going to be imperfect in some way. Yeah. So you know, because of that, we need to take a scientific approach. And what do scientists do? Scientists don't run one experiment and say, well, clearly this was a success. Let's roll it out and build new technology around it. Mm. It gets peer reviewed, right? So, yeah. you know, if we run it again, um, you know, do, do we get the same result? If we run it over a different, you know, day of the week or a different time zone, do we get the same result? Um, something else that I've been advised to do uh, that I've, I've seen that, that some people recommend whenever you're trying particularly a new CRO platform is to run an AA test, mm -hmm. which is different to a, an AB test. Basically, you're running two variations of the exact same page just to calibrate that the system is working correctly. If it comes out saying that, oh, yeah, one is definitely better than the other, then uh, you need to look again. Yes, yes. That's actually a pretty good, uh, a pretty good way to catch some of the... Uh, some of the sloppier testing tools will will you know <laughs> give you big congratulations about the big conversion increase that the identical page achieved. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, so I mean, the the general rule is be suspicious. Don't take yeah. anything on face value, right? Um, so we, we're going to run through some other ways in which conversion. Um, methods, conversion optimization, split testing methods can fool you. And one of these is when a higher conversion rate doesn't mean more conversions. And this might sound insane. <laughs> How can this be true? But Shane, you have a, yeah. a really good example. Yeah. So this is very much from the software side. This is, you know, based on a real example. Um, here's uh, what I'm showing here is uh, something that you've seen many times. Imagine this kind of thing showing up as a light box on a website, right? You visit the website mm -hmm. and then this thing pops up with some kind of a message in it, right? It does, it's irrelevant. The message in here is irrelevant, but it says whatever, you know, sign up with your email here to get some free report or whatever. Okay, you've seen this kind of thing. Now, imagine that we're running a test on a website with this offer and we're running two variations or, or, or two versions of this. And in version A, the goal is obviously to get more leads. In version A, we're displaying this light box three seconds after someone visits a page. And we have a conversion rate of 4.3%. In version B, we're displaying the same light box with the same offer after 45 seconds. And here we have an 11.2% conversion rate. So the conversion rate of version B is definitely a lot higher. And if you think about it, if you think why that could be, I'm sure you can come up with, with a pretty reasonable explanation, right? I mean, in version A, we're basically hitting people with this offer right away. And, you know, they haven't even had time to look at our website and they don't, people don't like pop-ups anyway. So it's not really surprising that version A is underperforming, right? Mm. Unfortunately, that's not the case at all. What's really happening is if we break down these numbers and if we just look at a sample of 2,000 visitors evenly split between these two test versions, 
In ver version A, we have 1,000 visitors coming to this page. 985 of them see the actual form after three seconds, and 42 of them sign up. In version B, 1,000 visitors come to the page, and most of them leave before the 45-second timer is up and the form triggers, meaning only 314 of them ever see this form. And then 35 of the people, you know, 35 in total of these people sign up and become a new lead. So wow. overall, the conversion rate of the second form is a lot better, but it's, it's just because you've basically pre-selected to only show it to people who, have, who are already the most invested. And so then you have to ask yourself, what is the goal here? Is the goal to get a higher conversion rate on this form or is the goal to get more leads from visitors to your website? And obviously, that's usually the goal, right? You want more leads. You don't want a higher conversion rate. Yeah, it's, uh, so that's the, the ultimate question. So your conversion rate in this case is, is misleading. If it's based on how many people who see the form sign up yeah because in in actual fact the number of people who visit the page version a is 25 percent higher convert converting yeah so it's it's an example of how the way that you measure and what you choose to measure can prejudice the results and so again for you know from the software side um there's there's two two problems with this the first is that the data you're seeing here is not wrong it is not wrong that the conversion rate of option B is higher. That is true. Like the calculation is correct. Even if we assume the measurement is, is perfect, these numbers are not wrong. Uh, and also, you know, and this is, I think, especially problematic, like in the WordPress space where many little tools have some testing thing. These tools will often not tell you exactly what is being measured. So you might be looking at this result. You don't even know that it's based on impressions, not views. And there's no way to find out. The tool simply does not tell you this. And so unless you know exactly what's being measured, you can really be led by solid, sound, true data in the completely wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And to, so the takeaway for me here is you always have to know exactly what is being measured and, what is, and also you know, what, is, what is not being measured. You have to know what you're blind to because there are factors like this, you know, visits versus impressions, page views versus unique visitors. Uh, even if we're talking about unique visitors, is that unique per session or unique per seven day period or unique per 30 day period? Do you know what happens in your testing tool if I look at variation A of your page today on my mobile phone and then seven days from now in a coffee shop from a different device on a different IP address, I look at your page again and I convert. What happens in your testing tool? in this scenario. Now, in some cases, the answer is it doesn't matter. For the thing I'm testing, it doesn't matter whether we're testing page views or unique visitors. It doesn't matter whether we track cross device or not. But my point is you have to know exactly what is being measured and how that's relevant to your actual business goal. Hmm. It's almost like you don't know what question you're asking. You don't, you don't know what the question was, but you're, you're assuming yeah, you, that the answer is correct. Exactly, exactly. So the tool will give you an answer, but if you don't know what the question was, that's <laughs> not very useful, yes. Brilliant. So uh, the next pitfall is when conversions don't mean profits. You know, how can an increase in conversions not result in, in more money? If, you, if you're selling more things, how could you not be making more money? Well, it's, it's, it's possible. Here's an example that, that I took from a client um, with million dollar per month turnover. And this is a test run over practically a week. Yeah, seven days. And you can see that we're testing the original. That's the blue line against the variation, which is the, the pink line. And looking at the standard conversion rate, uh, statistics, we can see there's a 53% improvement with a variation versus the original. And this is running at a 97% confidence, right? We are practically certain that you can almost guarantee statistically that variation one is going to be the winner, right? So can we take this to the bank? Is this, is this, you know, should we now do a little dance and say we've, you know, increased are the size of our business by 50%. Well, 
interestingly, um, as, as many testing tools will, this one was using convert.com, um, you can, many testing tools will let you connect the testing tool to Google Analytics. And that's what we've done in this case. And, and the client had e-commerce tracking set up correctly so that every time somebody bought, we knew that they bought and we knew how much they'd spent. What that then lets convert.com do is let you track revenue per visitor instead of conversion rate. And that gives us a distinctly different picture. It's variation one still winning. I, I, I looked, but I couldn't find an example where the conversion rate was high, but revenue was down. Um, but look at this, the, the difference in spend was only 36%, not 53%. All right, so it's a third lower than the conversion rate variation would suggest. And look at the confidence. The confidence here is only 87% chance of winning. That means that the original still has a 12, 13, that's a one in eight chance of, of beating the variation. So if, yeah. you'd, if you stop the test at this point based purely on conversion rate, it's not showing you the whole picture. But I, th I think what we're getting at, Shane, is that the, the real question is, it, I mean, it may be conversion rate that matters, right? It depends on your strategic goal of a campaign. You know, is it to gain market share? Is it to get more customers? Is it to get the best customers, the ones that are going to spend more and then keep spending? Right. Yeah, or, or is it or is it short term revenue? And all of those are valid, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's also again, this is this is all stuff that the testing tool will not be able to tell you. And and this is, you know, it's a good example where this confidence value is an important value, but in in most cases you will get um, you, you will get something that looks like a very nice confidence value, very high confidence value early on, early-ish on in the test. If you just keep it running, that confidence value will drop again and then slowly start climbing up again. And, and this is just another thing where, you know, the tool will tell you and the mathematics are all correct. The tool will tell you this is 99% confidence, definitely winning, but you just leave the test running. You just leave it running for another three weeks and then the confidence level goes down again and sometimes, you know, the, a, a different variation starts winning and so on. Um, and that's just another thing you have to be aware of, right? And here, tying it to revenue at least gives you a more realistic picture of what's really going on. Yeah. So here, here's something that, that we should try and a, a way in which we should try and adjust our, our thinking. It's called the the revenue myth. So, right, look at the this equation below, right? Conversion rate multiplied by the average spend or the average revenue per visitor gives you your total revenue, right? That is That seems to be a mathematical truth. Look, it's got an equation, there's an equal sign. You can't mess with that stuff, okay? However, there's, there's stuff that isn't shown. What, what we're doing with this and what we're doing when we um, reduce the, the universe of marketing down to things that can be measured, what we are actually doing is we are re reducing it. We're using a reductionist model right so that we can measure it and we've got to do that if we want to measure however when you reduce something you lose information of different types so here what's the information that's being lost okay we make a change to conversion rate and um, well we make some changes that improves the conversion rate right more people buy more people sign up however the same change could also impact the uh, average spend or the revenue per visitor. Say, for example, that you've got a, a range of customers who come to your site and you, let's say we add a, a make a change to a promotion to say that, you know, there's some extra bonus or we've made something cheaper. Now, what that could do is increase the conversion rate but if, it, if the change to the promotion makes it appeal more to people who don't spend as much, then the increased conversion rate combined with lower spending and at the same time, on the flip side, putting off the people who are likely to spend a lot more, then you could end up with higher conversion rate but lower revenue. 
Yeah, or even I mean, I think the the thing that's that's not being measured, even if you have, even if you do get uh, more revenue, um, it w what's not being measured here, which can be a very important factor, is like the quality of the customer. Yeah, uh, the, the match between the customer. You know, that's that's one of the things that you can sell almost anything by putting a countdown timer on it and making it very cheap. Where people will buy it, whatever it is, if it's cheap enough and it's about to run out, people will buy it. But that's not necessarily, you don't necessarily want those people to be your customers. That's something that's not necessarily being measured here. Um, and here, I guess, the, 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 another point, we've been talking about all this stuff, and I think one, one of the things that really irks me, you know, CRO, conversion rate optimization, is that is the acronym we're using. Everybody knows what it means, but it, it really is a misnomer, isn't it? Because we're not trying to improve a conversion rate. Um, even conversion optimization, I usually say conversion optimization, I, 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 I avoid that R there because, well, here's a very simple example and, and, and we're going to go, we're going to dive a bit deeper on this idea. So if we, if we go to the next slide, right, if we have, this is, would be a very typical, very basic pricing table, okay? We have a pricing table with three options. So how do we increase the conversion rate on this? Well, here's a very simple way to do it. We just get rid of those prices, right? Now we have an increased conversion rate of people who visit this page to people who click on one of these buttons. So congratulations, we've achieved a higher click-through rate. We've increased the conversion rate of something on the website. But obviously, and I'm using this as an obvious example, obviously that doesn't do anything for the business. That hasn't helped anyone. And that's why I don't like the term conversion rate optimization. You can increase conversion rates everywhere without doing anything positive for the business. And so, you know, it, it brings the question, what exactly are you measuring? What exactly is the goal? And how can you optimize this business? How can you optimize the entire business, not just a conversion rate on a page on the website? Yeah, I've, I've actually got a, uh, a case study, which I, I haven't included in this, but it just just brings it to mind. Um, I was working for a very well-known uh, internet marketer who was releasing a, a book on marketing, and he asked me to have a look at the sales page for for this new book that he was promoting. Mm -hmm. And um, what what the, the, the proposition was saying, um, basically the book would only cost you one cent, and um, you know, and it was great value. And we had a form on the side that you needed to just put your details in and then click through. What then happened was that it would explain that that you that you needed to pay the shipping rate mm -hmm. relevant to that. The book would only cost you one cent, but it'd be another you know two dollars ninety nine or whatever for the shipping in the U.S. and Canada and so on. More for overseas. Now, so one thing I thought was. I wonder if um, more people would click through, but then when they see that it's not a penny, it's actually three dollars or so, that you know maybe that would come as a, a slight shock, slight disappointment. Yeah. You know, because I mean, look, we can always in, in, always um, improve click through rates by saying free money for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Right? A thousand dollars for everyone who clicks this button. You know, people are going to click it, <laughs> but but if you if you then sa you know sacrifice their trust and, and if you can't follow up on a promise, then conversion rates bound to suffer but so what I actually found on on this particular page was when I put the explicit details on the previous page to say that yes it's one penny plus it's whatever the conversion rate did actually drop it went down um, which is similar to to this example so it was actually it, you know um, similar <laughs> but more more people clicked through when it was simpler and they yeah. they weren't they weren't bothered when we then explained to them oh there's a two dollar fifty charge. Part of the reason may be if anyone's read um, Robert Cialdini's book Influence, is that by looking at the previous page, clicking the button, you've made one micro commitment to go through. Mm. So you've got some forward momentum there. But yeah, so what was, I, I can I can back this up. Uh, this this then brings us on to a another myth that's related to the revenue myth. Which is that, and look, I'm, I hold my hands up, I'm guilty of this. I put this equation in my book, Convert, in 2011. Which is saying that click-through rate 1 multiplied by click-through rate 2 multiplied by click-through rate 3 by 4 gives you your ultimate conversion rate. Now, 
when you take a slice, when you freeze it at a point in time, that's true. It's mathematically true. The number of people who click through from one, two, three, four, gives you that answer. But it stops being true over time, just like the revenue myth. If you make a change to improve conversion rate, you know, you may at the same time be reducing your, um, your revenue per visitor. Now on here, it's the same thing. When you make changes to this thing, it doesn't necessarily, it, it, it stops being in the you know, obscure abstract mathematical realm when you get human beings involved. So let's say that I change my, my promotion at the front end and I add a bit of hyperbole and I fluff it up and make it sound more exciting. Um, that might inc increase the click-through rate, but the same thing, the fact that I'm getting more people through, maybe I'm getting different people through, or maybe I'm setting their expectations wrongly, then the second click-through rate might suffer, you know, by being th the backswing against the first click-through rate going up. So, you know, we cannot, we cannot be, I think the lesson is too reductionistic, and we cannot just slice all of our funnels and make everything discrete and measurable in this way. Yeah, everything is cross-dependent, right? Yeah, it's, it's an ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah, everything is connected. You can't make, in marketing, in psychology, when you're dealing with human beings, you can't make changes independent mm -hmm. of, um, of knock-on effects. So let's solve this problem. We talked about click-through rates and, and you know why conversion rate optimization isn't what we're looking for. So let's just solve this once for all. We just test all the way through to revenue, right? Instead of measuring clicks, instead of measuring number of conversions and stuff like that, let's test the revenue. Because obviously, right, if you, if you test number of conversions, that doesn't necessarily give you the result you want because I would rather have uh, 10 people buying something for a thousand dollars than a hundred people buying something for one dollar right so let's test for revenue that's the goal of the business is generate more revenue so if we do that problem solved right unfortunately not quite so in in addition to the problems we saw before um, if you if we go to the next slide so you want to test for revenue but if you look at like your business process the process that people go through in your business you know, at they visit your site, at some point they click that add to cart button, they view your checkout pages, go through that process, they make a purchase that has a certain value. Then this user might require support that will cost a certain amount. Then this user may or may not refer customers. This user may renew for a certain number of cycles on a subscription or may return to become a repeat customer a certain number of times. The user may upgrade or downgrade. And all of this stuff affects what you really want to do in your business. So it's not just, if you're just measuring, um, if you're just measuring the revenue generated after checkout, that's still not giving you the big picture. And like we said before, every, all of this stuff is interdependent, right? So if we move ahead, if we, if we look at you know, the support factor, if you test something like your value proposition or your pricing or, or something else in your offer, that will definitely have effects on you know different kinds of people that are attracted to different kinds of offer offers will require different amounts of support which will incur different amounts of uh, different costs and they will also have different behaviors in terms of their return visits or their, their return purchases in terms of referrals and so on now um, if you just if you if you basically stop your testing here what I'm saying is that doesn't solve your issue entirely because you're still not seeing the whole picture. And it can, especially with things like value proposition, offer and price testing, you, you can get something that wins at this stage and generates more revenue right away, but then ends up losing if we take everything else into consideration. And we can make this even more complicated if we start taking the cost of acquisition into account, right? If you really want, because the, the, the goal of a business is not to generate revenue, it's to generate profit in most cases, right? You wanna have profit. So if, you, if you'd really want to have the big picture, you would have to take all this and more into account. Now, I am not saying this to try and discourage you 
I'm not saying this to say, well, you know, you have to have this massive setup that takes your cost of acquisition into account for every test you run and goes all the way through to, you know, I don't know how cohort tests of how long each test variation leads to renewal cycles and no 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 this is almost impossible to do all you know testing all the way through is almost impossible to do it's impractical to do i mean shane just look, even look in your business i mean i'm a thrive themes customer yeah and i'm subscribed on a an annual yeah. uh, subscription right and in here you've got renews for how many cycles you know that's repeat purchases or maybe even you know upsells and cross sells can come into that kind of thing but you know you can't you can't do any meaningful test on you know, if we make this change, will it make an impact on our renewal rate? Exactly, yeah. I mean, we'd have to te- run a test for like five years to, to see that. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, right? So I'm not saying you have to have this amazing measurement system in place uh, to be able to test all of this and so on. What I'm saying is you have to be aware of what you're measuring and what you aren't measuring. You have to, be, uh, you have to know about the blind spots in your process, right? You have to know... How far am I measuring? What am I not taking into account? And you have to be, again, the, the goal is business optimization. Right? How do I optimize this business? And, and to me, the most important thing is, you know, it's, like we said in the beginning, you know, it's very easy to make very attractive sounding statements like change this on your landing page and boost your conversions by 178%. And that is taking a tiny slice out of your business process, even if it's true. And being blind to everything else that goes on in your business and everything else that affects the, the, the bottom line of your business is a huge mistake to make in testing and in conversion optimization. Yeah, so in a way, what we're, what we're saying is that, what, what is it that we're, that we're saying? That we shouldn't start running around our, you know, waving our hands and screaming that there are things that we can't measure, mm. right? It's almost like we're saying we need to get beyond the idea that the only things that matter are things that we can measure. Yeah. Which is getting slightly ethereal. And, <laughs> and you know, here's the point where, you know, we could get burnt at the stake. Well, we even ask the question, does conversion rate even matter? And Shane, I would add to that, um, I know you've questioned the, um, the, the use of conversion rate. Yeah. I would also like to question the, the use of the word optimization. Right. Because op- optimization means um, f- finding the peak of something, yeah. right? Now, what do we know about testing conversion rates or trying to improve anything trying to improve tolerances you know trying to squeeze more more speed out of a race car engine the 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 closer that you get to the optimal point the more difficult it gets to make additional increases yeah right so um this is called the law of diminishing returns yeah then the the more improvements you make the more costly time consuming it's going to be to get further improvements. So I, I actually prefer to use the term conversion improvement mm. n- rather than conversion optimization even because, you know, um, optimization isn't really feasible or cost effective. Yeah, at some point, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, we should consider that conversion rate isn't isn't our, our our ultimate goal um so you know does it matter well yes it matters unless it doesn't this yeah, is really yes. the answer and and there's a serious point to this and the point is strategically what is the goal of your campaign you know amazon for example deliberately lost money when they launched as an online bookstore mm-hmm. Then you know that gradually b- became profitable over time. They deliberately lost money on selling music and on selling DVDs and everything else. Every new arm that they add to the business, they deliberately run it as a loss leader for two or three years. And you know the reason is because they they want to gain market share. So you know the the question has to be. Do we want conversions? Do we want revenue? Do we want long-term, you know, customer, great customers, or do we want market share? And, you know, so it's not necessarily conversion rate. It's what should you be testing? Um, 
so we've got a few, we've got a few more little uh, bits of advice as well to to deliver on this um is what one of my favorite little jokes it tickles me anyway there's this idea of a a tourist uh, gets lost driving around ireland and um stops sees an old fellow by the side of the road and stops to to ask for directions to kilkenny or wherever it may be and the old fella thinks for a minute and says ah well i wouldn't start from here <laughs> right which is you know a great example of irish humor but um very often we f- we, we we find that in uh, split testing when we can get drawn into fiddling tweaking and making changes that don't that yeah they may matter a little bit and fool ourselves trick ourselves into thinking that that we are improving something that we're making a real difference when in fact we're only making difference of small percentages and sometimes what you need to do is is to take a big step back and make radical changes so I, I mean, I'd be interested to know what your experience is from, you know, the tests that you, that you've run. Yeah, I mean, this is this is another thing where I think uh, my perspective is interesting because I, I I've never had like a high traffic volume business, so I've never had um, the kind of business where we have millions of visitors to test stuff on, which mm. makes the the question of where should we even start from very difficult to find out via testing or via this, you know, this kind of uh, A-B testing. Uh, but there are better, better ways to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm reminded of, you know, one example, going back to that, um, that book marketing page that I did for, for this other marketer. Um, one of the things we tried was, um, yeah, we, we added an intro video, that helped. Right, that was, that was like an incremental change. It, it, it supported what the page was doing. Um, but the, the other thing that you should be thinking is, well, okay, what different angle, whole different angle could the page take? So you really want to be, you know, testing, trying to, if you're trying to find the highest point on a map, right, and you, you, all you can do is guess, you don't want to make little guesses around your first guess. You want to make a range of guesses, a range of measurements to get that. Yeah. Um, so the, one of the next things we tried was actually... Do you know what? Let, what if we throw away all that sales copy, right? And basically put one paragraph and then page after page after page of testimonials. So this mm. is when the book was already out and people were you know, were reviewing it and talking about it and it was working well. And that worked. That that got us something like another another twenty percent boost in conversions. Yeah. With just saying, oh, let's let's just try just drenching them in um, mm. you know uh, soft reviews you know that that kind of uh what's it called soft evidence yeah i mean and it's also you know from the startup perspective it's also um the kind of pivot where you're like okay we have something interesting we have the the core of something interesting but we have to create a completely different product because people aren't buying the one we created what do we do as an alternative and and that's where um you know for me the way i've done this is is with what's called qualitative data or in other words talking to people <laughs> talking <laughs> to people and and uh, you know surveys and stuff like that where you where you get that kind of human level input that's uh, where you you kind of almost form an intuition about what people want but the intuition is based on having talked to 50 people about the problems they have and and thinking about how you can solve them right and an ab test doesn't give you that yeah, absolutely. It, you know, if again, it's anything that can be reduced to numbers is naturally just going to be reduced. Mm. Yeah. So um, w- obviously, th- th- this almost needs to go without saying, but you know, it's a very technical term. But don't polish turds, yeah. right? If, if you've got something that's no good to start with, you're not going to be able to make it better without a radical course of of improvement sometimes you have to you you really do don't start from here sometimes it's a case of you know throw it away and try something radically different unfortunately this is this is what i call the the third polishing dilemma is that um you know with the testing tool the easiest thing to do is third polishing and then what what we mean by that is like just tweaking something small right change the button text 
test what happens if you have a different button text. That's a test that you can set up and start in probably under a minute with most tools. It's very easy to do. Changing the value proposition of your entire website or changing and testing a completely different product or completely different product angle, that is much, much more complicated, much more time consuming to do. And that's the dilemma, right? The potential payoff is much greater, but it's also a greater risk to do a large, bold test uh, because it could, could go horribly wrong. Um, so the potential upside and downside are much greater um, and it's much more difficult to do. And that's why uh, basically we, we often end up doing the tweaking, the turd polishing thing, because it's just so much easier and we're busy with other stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's it's I think it's particularly tempting when it's your own business, when it's your own campaign. And the longer you stare at something, sometimes you 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 very often find you you, you just can't see it. You can't see it objectively anymore. Yeah. And I find that working on my own marketing is the hardest thing that I ever have to do. It's so much easier to take a client site and to see exactly what they need to be changing yeah, definitely. because I'm not connected to it. You know, you, you just, you get so close that you just can't see the wood for the trees. It's, it's something we also call the your baby is ugly syndrome. <laughs> you know, every, every parent is in love with their baby. It's just, it's just the way it is. And sometimes when a client has been, you know, they've been working on this for 10 years and you turn up and go, let's try something drastically different. Mm. It, it can really you know, really great on you. And, but, you know, literally you just can't see it. Um, so, yeah, next, next little tip is the ice cream conundrum. So let's just work through a little scenario. You've got a guy called Angelo who runs an ice cream emporium and people can come in. You know, he's got a range of different ice cream flavors on there. And he does well. You know, people come in, get their ice cream, pay their money, go away, come back again. Now, Angelo then decides to get smart. He gets a business coach and the coach says, oh, you should try conversion rate optimization. It's the latest thing. It will make you more money because you improve your conversion rate. So what he does is he decides to run a survey and he collects statistical data. So every time somebody comes in and orders chocolate ice cream or butterscotch or strawberry or mint chop chip, he, he marks, makes a record of it. And then it takes him three months and he's painstakingly recorded every single flavor that people have ordered. And what does he learn at the end of this? He learns that vanilla is the st statistical winner, right? Vanilla is ordered 21% of the time, and that is 15% higher than any other flavor. So should Angelo then ditch all the rest of his other ice cream flavors and all his other recipes and only sell vanilla ice cream? Well, obviously that would be incredibly stupid to do. Why is it incredibly stupid? Because some people don't like vanilla. Yeah, it may be the, in a first past the post test, it may be the highest converting, but some people like strawberry. Some people even like rum and raisin, you know? <laughs> I think another, another thing here with the ice cream is that you know, we, we've talked about the don't start from here problem, which is that the, the testing or the polling of what happens when people buy ice cream, um, uh, it, you know, it doesn't tell you things like, well, you know, maybe, maybe people want a combination um, of ice cream that you, that you haven't thought of yet. Um, and here, the, and, and another problem is like the creative problem where even if you talk to people about what they, what they like, what flavors they like and so on, that still probably won't give you the information you need to create a new amazing uh, ice cream combination that, that's going to be the new hit. So mm. there, there is like a creativity gap where sometimes you just cannot get the data that will tell you what the next big thing is going to be. You can't get it qualitatively, you can't get it quantitatively. You have to do something creative. And there the trick becomes to do something creative with as little risk and as little time investment as possible and then gather data about it. But you can't, mm. you can't be clinging on to the data, hoping to be able to reach for the revolution, so to speak, while you're still holding data in your hand. You have to take that leap and, and make that risk. And then once, you, you know, once you've done it, 
do it in a smart way and collect data so it tells you whether you should you know keep producing this new flavor of ice cream or not but there's just this human factor that nobody can uh, like nobody can relieve you of that responsibility of, of doing the creative work mm. and, and like you said before Shane the the um, the results of Angelo's experiment were absolutely correct yes you know it's you know the the, the stats don't lie the stats are right the problem is the question was wrong you know we were saying you know which is the highest converting flavor of ice cream well actually it's all of them it's all the flavors that people bought over those three months potentially because some people will have gone in saying no i want a chocolate and raspberry you know one scoop of chocolate one scoop of raspberry and that's correct for that person yeah, yeah. so you know we, there's a problem then with the ice cream conundrum, which is that it can, because of the manner of the test that we're using and the way that it's constructed, it, it mixes up all of our segments together. And um, in Convert, one of the biggest realizations that I had when you know, putting that together and doing my own research on it was that if we run a first-past-the-post test, which an A-B test is, or A-B-C test, then the, the nature of the question you're asking is, which is the highest converting out of these? Presupposing that it's an either-or problem, right? When in fact, in reality, it's a both-and situation that you've got. You know, he can sell strawberry and chocolate and vanilla and rum and raisin, because different groups of people will like different things. Um, I'm working with one client right now who sells uh, vitamin and uh, vitamin supplements, mineral supplements um, in the USA. Now, that's got me thinking that th there are different markets. There are c clearly different se segments. A, a man um, aged over 40 will have different, very different concerns. Um, he'll be thinking about things like yeah, controlling my weight, energy levels, you know, erectile dysfunction, prostate issues, and things like that. Right? Compare that to a woman aged twenty-five to thirty who you know wants to get pregnant. She hasn't got any of the same concerns that that guy's got. They're completely different concerns, right? But the same product could, in theory, um, could could suit both of them. So, you know, if we did a test and, you know, because there's more men over 40 who come to the website, it tells us that the, a message pitched at middle-aged guys is the winner to stop marketing to, you know, women in their 20s would be a clearly a mistake. But, you know, sometimes that's just the way that by selecting a method of testing can prejudice the results again. Yeah. So this, this leaves us with, you know, it's, it's almost like we've, you know, we've poured doubt onto, <laughs> onto everything. You can't trust the numbers. You know, is it really about conversion rate or revenue or, or maybe nothing at all? And, um, you know, is there a point of, of testing at all? Well, we, we think there is. Um, but one thing we do know is you've got to test what, what actually matters. Where does the rubber meet the road? And nobody can tell you that. It's down to the particular environment of, of the campaign that you're wanting to run. What is your goal? This is a great little example. Uh, about, I'd say about 18 months ago, I collected the results of about 50 split tests that I'd run. Some of them AB, some of them had more variations from a variety of sites, sometimes my own sites, quite a few client sites. And... Um, I collated them depending on, I, I, I measured whether they were style changes, content changes, so usually wording or an image, or was I testing both style and content changes? And it's not very easy to see, but you've got things like uh, you know, changing form text was a content change, had negative 23% impact. So I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm measuring the greatest impact of any of the variations. Right, um, adding the opt-in crusher pr produced a twenty-nine percent positive change. You know, so and then we've got style changes. Change site background color 
negative 4%, right? Now, what I then did was I uh, displayed those on a graph. So their style changes only are in the first column, column one. Column two is content changes only. Column three is where I changed both content and style. And you can see the, the magnitude and the direction of the of the results here. Now, what I really want people to get is, look at the style changes. The the That bottom one there was a negative 9%, right? But generally, they were between nothing and 5%, either good or bad. Now, I, I've been in this business, I've been a professional web designer for 20 years, 20, what, this is my 21st year of doing this, and I could only I've never been able to manage a, a double-figure impact in percentage terms, right, with style changes. So color, um, graphics, typography, right? Does it, does it matter? Yes, a little bit, right? But look at the content changes. They are typically between 5 and 20%. Right? That's the normal range when you're changing content and generally positive, as well. On average, the style changes were negligible, right? If, if anything, maybe slightly negative. Content changes, generally positive, 5 to 20%. And when I was changing both content and style, again, similar range, you know, in the, the 0 to maybe 40, 50% mark. So what we need to learn from this, what matters is what you say. It's, that's much more important than how you say it. There's no graphic design tricks or um, you know wording tricks that are really going to compensate for not understanding who your audience is not understanding why they should accept the offer that, that you've got you know or really making a powerful promise to those people so that's really where my work has moved on to I'd say primarily in the the last couple of years yeah the, I, I'm this, this slide is kind of to reiterate what I said before, um, where, you know, for, for these kinds of things, for when you want to figure out, you know, you're making, let's say, a big style and content change, but what should you change your style and content to? Um, where should you start from? Where do you, in what direction do you pivot your business? For a lot of testing, I think, I think the most powerful thing I can offer is that your tests should be informed by real human insights. In other words, they should be informed by qualitative data. You should be testing something that, uh, that you're not just going, well, I'm gonna change the fonts and see what happens. You should be testing a different value proposition because in the conversations you've had with your customers, people keep mentioning this one thing and you're testing a new value proposition that suggests a solution to that one thing. So is, is really the combination of actual human interaction of, of things like customer development, interviews, surveys, and so on, and then use testing and quantitative stuff to confirm what you learn uh, on, on the human side. That's the most important thing that I think you can take away for your own testing. Mm. So, because the, the testing cannot give you new ideas. All it can do is tell you which of the old ideas performs better than any others. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. There, um, a word of warning on that one as well. Um, there's the book called Love Marks, uh, which came out about 10 years ago. And that in had featured a, a little uh, story of, uh, yeah, Shane, I, I think you're a bit younger than me, but if, if you were around in the 80s at all, do you remember um, Sony Sports Walkmans? No, that's, that's probably before <laughs> my time still. <laughs> Okay, so basically this was, um, you know, Walkman was a portable cassette player, you know, you pop your, your, your C90 tape in it and, you know, walk along with it with your headphones in. Imagine an iPod, but with a, a tape in it, okay? Yeah. So <laughs> then Sony brought out these sports ones, which were big, chunky yellow ones, and they were waterproof, right? That was the, that was the idea. Now, there was a focus group, you know, the product development company or the agency that they hired they, they wanted to know um, if did the world want a a uh, portable stereo you know the ghetto blaster version of the sports kind of walkman so um, they, they thought it was a good idea they ran a focus group to say okay well should it be black like 
practically, you know, every portable stereo was black or silver in those days, right? So should we just make it black like all the other ones, or should we make it bright yellow like the Sports Walkman? Now, they ran a focus group. They got 20 or so people in the room, and they showed them pictures of what it would look like in black and what it would look like in yellow, and they asked them to say what they would do. And the vast majority of the people said, do it in yellow. Yellow is better. It's more distinctive. It's different to everything else, right? Mm -hmm. And then they, they concluded the focus group, and they sent people out through, you know, as you leave through that door, there is, you know, the two tables with free portable stereos for you. I would, we would love you to take one with our compliments to say thank you for giving up your time and participating in this. So the people go out, there's a table with black stereos on, there's a table with yellow stere stereos on. Every single person took a black one. <laughs> okay. So the, the, the moral of the story is don't ever think about asking people what they would do, how they would behave in a hypothetical situation because the reality is you know, just as likely to be the opposite as, as what they actually say. So it's better to observe the way they actually behave in a qualitative way yeah. Than, yeah. than to ask hypothetical uh, questions. Yeah, absolutely. So I've included this little slide. I, I, I find this really helpful thinking about CRO. This is a statue or a bust of the Roman god Janus, which is where we get January from, the first month of the year. It's the start of the new year. And he's got an older face that, that looks backwards in time. And he's got an, a second face that looks forward in time. So he's looking backwards and forwards at the same time. And I, I think this is a really helpful metaphor for the, the way in which we need to get to thinking about, about our marketing in general. Because what this tells us is, you know, looking back in time, that's your quantitative data, primarily. You know, when you run tests, when you try things, when you've got your analytics, all of that is old and frozen in time, right? And it's measurable. But what that can't give you is ideas and creativity. And that's why we need to use those human faculties as well. We need to look ahead in time and say, well, what else could we do? What might work better? than that, than, than what we've done before. Because the tests can't help you do that. So we need to use both. So we need to, yeah, I guess what we're saying is take the quantitative stuff, yeah? Observe it and say, yes, according to the question that the test was asking, these are the facts. But you also need to interpret those facts in, in your own context, depending on what's right for your campaign, what you want to do, and then apply your creativity. Well, what could work even better than that to achieve our goals? So, you know, to sum up, yeah, anyone who tells you that you've got to be using AdWords, you've got to be using uh, conversion rate optimization, you've got to be using any particular tool, don't believe those people. There, There is no secret ingredient. Conversion rate optimization could make you, you know, make the difference between success and failure in your campaigns, but it could go the other way. Don't let it lead you down blind alleys. Yes. So can we sum up? Um, yeah, I, I think, <laughs> um, yeah, like, like I said, I think for me, what it would really, the big takeaway is, 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 you know, unless you're combining, like know about the technical shortcomings of tools, know what's going on. And unless you combine your testing and your CRO with qualitative data, uh, you you simply have to be aware that you don't really know where the test results are leading you, even if they look very nice. Yeah, so so it's almost like, you know, for for me, it's a we need to accept all of this stuff, and we need to be open to it. We need to take the the attitude of of a scientist or an explorer to say, I just want to gather as much information as I can, um, but ultimately. What can you actually trust? Um, and, you know, I, I would say have the courage of your own convictions. You know, sometimes you just know that, that do, a particular thing is the right thing to do. And it may not be anything that you can ever prove over any time of you know, length of, of time scale. But sometimes you know that treating your customers in this way is going to be the right thing in some way 
you know, even if it, if you can never run a split test over it. So, you know, doubt everything. Um, there's, there's a great quote as well that I like that says, um, trust those who seek the truth, mistrust those who find it. <laughs> I like that one. So closing words from uh, ancient Chinese philosopher. Yeah. So this, uh, like as a second quote to close this presentation is, true wisdom is knowing what you don't know. And, and I really want to be clear that, you know, in this presentation, we're not trying to tell you not to do testing or discourage you by showing you all the things that can go wrong and all the things you need to be aware of. But it is, it, it's a lot of power to know exactly what you know and to know what you're blind to. And it can help you make the right decision. Yeah, because there's, there's probably, you know, an infinite amount more in knowledge in the universe that, that we don't know and won't ever know than, than what we can actually see and test and measure with our own eyes. So, you know, we need, yeah, that, that mix, that magical combination of, um, of analysis and intuition. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, it's, I've uh, enjoyed very much going over this. We, we had a lot of fun putting this together. Um, I hope it's been useful for everyone else. Same here, yeah. So you can learn more uh, from Ben Hunt at webdesignfromscratch.com and you can learn more about me and what I do at thrivethemes.com. And so thank you very much for watching this and I hope you enjoy the rest of CRO Day.